This video is to support a course that I'm teaching in introductory proof writing. So in the last episode, we looked at the principle of mathematical induction and we did several examples. And today we want to look at maybe a more advanced version of mathematical induction, sometimes called strong induction. Although I will admit that some of the examples that we do will not quite be strong induction, but I think it's close enough under the umbrella of strong induction that it's nice to look at all of these at the same time. Maybe a better way of thinking of this would be a more advanced induction. Okay, so let's see maybe an outline for a proof using strong induction. And so let's say that we want to show for all natural numbers n, really any discrete indexing set, p of n, where p of n is some mathematical statement depending on n. And what we mean by p of n, we're, it means we want to show that that is true. And so our proof outlines like this. So we might have more than one base case. So here I've written base cases. And we want to establish the truth of P1, P2, all the way up to Pj, where that J is really going to depend on the calculations involved in the induction step, which is the next step. And that is you want to prove that P1 and P2 all the way up to Pk implies Pk plus 1. So instead of proving that PK implies PK plus 1, you want to prove that all previous statements imply PK plus 1. So you might have to use more than one previous statement to prove the next statement. That's what I have down here. Like when would you use this more advanced version of induction or this strong induction? And that's when PK is not enough to prove K PK plus 1. Okay, so let's jump into some examples. I think we're gonna do about three of them. So this first one has to do with the Fibonacci numbers. So let's recall how they're defined. We have f sub one equals f sub two equals one. So those are the two seeds. And then we have our recursion identity, which is f sub n plus two equals f sub n plus one plus f sub n. And what we wanna show is that f sub n is bigger than or equal to three halves to the n minus three for all natural numbers n. And maybe a little hint that we might want to use strong induction here is the fact that we've got a two-step recursion. And since we've got a two-step recursion, we probably are going to need two previous cases to prove the next case instead of just one previous case. And so that's maybe not the full power of strong induction, but it's a little more than maybe the basic induction. Okay, so let's maybe prove our base cases first. So our base cases here will be n equals one and n equals two. Again, because we've got this two-step recursion, that's kind of motivation for doing both of these base cases. So let's say n equals one, what do we get? We get f sub one, which is equal to one. But then I wanna notice that one is strictly bigger than four over nine, but four over nine is the same thing as three over two to the negative two. But that follows this inequality right here. So that establishes the base case here. Now let's look at n equals two. So we've got f sub two also equals one, but that's gonna be bigger than two thirds, which is the same thing as three halves to the negative one. Now, if we wanna be super explicit here, we can notice that negative two equals uh, one minus three, so it follows this formula right here, and negative one is the same thing as two minus three, so again, it follows this formula up here. Okay, so now let's move on to our induction hypothesis. So let's say induction hypothesis, we wanna suppose that all of these statements are true for some k. So let's suppose for some k bigger than or equal to one, f sub m is bigger than or equal to three halves to the m minus three for m less than or equal to k. So that's how we can write this kind of and statement all at once. So that's gonna be true for f sub one, f sub two, f sub three, all the way up to f sub k. Okay, good. Now we wanna look at the next case, the next case being the k plus first case. So maybe we would say something like consider f sub k plus one, like that. But now we can apply the recursion. Notice that that is f sub k plus f sub k minus one. 
But now this inequality holds for both of those because this is a strong inductive hypothesis. So this is going to be bigger than or equal to 3 halves to the k minus 3 plus 3 halves to the k minus 4, like that. Again, we just use this inequality with m equals k and m equals k minus 1, so there's not really much to that. Now we can factor out a greatest common factor from that. That's going to give us 3 halves to the k minus 4 times the quantity um, 3 halves plus 1, like that. But now notice that 3 halves plus 1 is exactly 5 halves. But 5 halves is, in fact, bigger than 9 over 4. So I'll let you guys check that, but that's not too hard to check just with arithmetic. So we get that this is bigger than or equal to 9 over 4 times 3 halves to the k minus 4. But now we can multiply that 9 over 4 inside. Notice 9 over 4 is the same thing as 3 over 2 squared. And that's going to give us... 3 over 2 to the k minus 2. Then if we want to be super explicit, we can see that this term right here is equal to k plus 1 minus 3, which is exactly what we want it to be to finish off this proof. So that finishes this proof. So let's get rid of this and we'll do another example. So for our next example, we're going to show that for all natural numbers n, 6 divides n cubed minus n. In other words, n cubed minus n is a multiple of 6. Again, we're going to use strong induction, so we're going to... And here we're going to use strong induction and multiple base cases. Although we'll see that we're using something that's not exactly strong induction, but it's some sort of skipping induction using multiple base cases. Okay, so let's check maybe the first three cases, n equals 1, 2, and 3, and make sure that this is okay. So let's label this base cases. So we'll say n equals 1. So we have 1 cubed minus 1 equals 0, but that's equal to 6 times 0. But 6 times 0 is clearly a multiple of 6, making 6 divide 1 cubed minus 1. Okay, now let's look at n equals 2. So that's going to give us 2 cubed minus 2, which equals 6, which equals 6 times 1. Again, it's a multiple of 6, so it's divisible by 6. We're good to go there. Now we'll do n equals 3. That's going to give us 3 cubed minus 3. So that's 27 minus 3, which is 24, which is equal to 6 times 4. Again, we're good to go there. That's a multiple of 6. Okay, now we want to move on to our induction hypothesis. So let's go ahead and suppose for k bigger than or equal to 3, we have 6 divides m cubed minus m for m less than or equal to k. Okay, so why k bigger than or equal to 3? Because our base cases cover everything up until that point, so we're good to go. Okay, great. So now let's go ahead and see what we need to do here. We might want to look at the k plus first case, but the k plus first case will be a little bit hard to work with. So will the k plus second case. In fact, we want to look at the k plus third case, and that will be sufficient because we have this skipping action. Especially if we added another base case of n equals zero, which would give us 0 cubed minus 0, which is still 0. So let's go ahead and sketch that out. We're going to consider k plus 3 cubed minus k plus 3. OK, so now let's multiply that out to see what we get. So here, this is just a binomial expansion. So maybe it's a little bit tricky, but it's not terrible. This is going to be k cubed plus 9k squared plus 27k plus 27. Again, by binomial coefficients and then squaring, cubing, and taking this guy to the first power. And then we have minus k minus 3. So next, we can group that k cubed and the k term together and apply the induction hypothesis to it. So I'll just write it like this, k cubed minus k. Then what do we have left over? We've got a 9k squared, a 27k, 
and then 27 minus three. So let's write that down. We have nine K squared plus 27 K plus 24. Okay, so I believe we can factor a three out of that and maybe that'll be helpful. So I'll take this guy right here and write it as six times A. So that's possible because six divides K cubed minus K, making K cubed minus K a multiple of six. And then this is gonna be plus three times three K squared plus nine K plus, so that'll be plus eight like that. But now we can do something a bit tricky here. I bet there are a bunch of ways to argue that this thing in parentheses is even, but the way that I wanna do it here is to factor it out this way. So I'm gonna factor this as three. That's just the three brought down here. And then we'll have three times K plus one times K plus two plus two. So you guys can check that that is in fact a way to write this guy up here. You can multiply this out and add two to it and see that you're good to go. But this is extremely helpful because K plus one and K plus two have opposite parity. But since they have opposite parity, that means that their product is even. So that's something that we proved like a while ago that if you take the product of two things with opposite parity, you'll get something that's even. That's because exactly one of them is even. So here we've got an even number plus an even number. That gives us an even number. But then we have that even number times three, that gives us a multiple of six. So that means we can write this as six times, I'll write it as capital A, where that's a combination of this little a, and then what we got from the argument that I just went over verbally, which you would have to obviously write out in words on your homework or something like that. So anyway, we got that k plus three cubed minus k plus three is a multiple of six by assuming that k cubed minus k was a multiple of six. So this in some ways gives us some sort of skipping style of induction. Not exactly strong induction, but let's sketch out exactly what happened here. So notice that P1 implies P4, P2 implies P5, and then P3 implies P6. But all of those columns happen like kind of independently. So down this line, we get P7 is implied. Down this line, we have P8 is implied. And down this line, P9 is implied. So after we set up our first row, which is like our base case, our like skipped by three induction step will imply everything else. Okay, we'll do one more example. Our last example has something to do with graph theory. So we wanna prove that every tree with n vertices has n minus one edges. I wanna recall that a tree is a connected graph without cycles. So here's an example of a tree. So notice we've got vertices here at all of these dots, and then we've got edges, you know, kind of as I've drawn. We've got an edge from this vertex to this vertex, this vertex to this vertex, and then so on and so forth. So this is an example of a tree. Now this over here is a non-example of a tree because it is not connected. Notice there is no path from this vertex to this vertex. Okay, and then this guy over here is also not a tree because it has something called a cycle, which I won't rigorously define with words, but it's one of those things that you kind of know when you see it. Notice we've got a cycle that goes around in this loop right here. So this proposition has to do with trees, in other words, objects like this. Okay, let's get rid of this picture and we'll look at the proof. Now we're ready to jump into the proof. So let's look at the base case. So the base case will be a tree with one vertex. But notice a tree with one vertex just has a single dot and nothing else. There can be no other edges. And because any edge that you would add would create a cycle because an edge has to have an initial point and a final point. And the initial point and the final point are both vertices. So if those initial points and the final points are the same, then you have a cycle. So clearly this has zero edges but zero is one minus one, so we're good to go here. Now we'll do strong induction. So we'll suppose 
for all m less than or equal to k, a tree with m vertices has m minus one edges. So like I said, that's our strong induction hypothesis. We're assuming that trees with one, two, three, up to k vertices have one minus one, two minus one, three minus one, up to k minus one edges. Okay, next we wanna consider a tree with k plus one vertices, and we'll call that tree T. Okay, and another thing that we wanna do is just pick an edge from that tree at random. So pick an edge, I'll call that edge E, and I'll put just E is in T, although that's a little bit sloppy, that's just an edge of the tree T. Now let's draw a little bit of a picture, starting with our edge E. So our edge E will have two vertices attached to it, as all edges do, and then the tree is going to expand off in this direction and expand off in this direction. What I wanna notice is if we remove E, we have two disjoint trees. So let's notice that removing E leaves us with two disjoint trees with M1 and M2 vertices. So let's maybe sketch that out. We'll say that this is going to be T1. That's gonna be the tree that is on the left-hand side after removing E. And then this is gonna be T2. That's gonna be tree on the right-hand side after removing E. So let's maybe point out right here that we're naming these trees T1 and T2 with M1 and M2 vertices respectively. So now I wanna notice a couple of things. Notice that M1 plus M2 is clearly equal to K plus one. Because we have not deleted any of the vertices, we've only deleted an edge, and that edge is E. Another thing that we can do is use our induction hypothesis to count up the number of edges of T. So let's do that. So number of edges of T equals number edges of T1 plus number of edges of T2 plus one. So we've got all the edges over here, all the edges over here, and then this edge E that we just removed. But obviously it's a part of T, so we still need to count that. But now by our induction hypothesis, this is M1 minus one, this is M2 minus one, so that leaves us with M1 minus one plus M2 minus one plus one. But now that combined with the fact that M1 plus M2 equals K plus one means all of this just combines together to give us K. But K is clearly K plus one minus one, so it satisfies the formula that we're trying to establish. And that's a good place to stop.